everyone and welcome to another exciting interview and today I have a very special guest. Our guest, actually we have two guests, sorry. We have Eddie Goldfarb and his daughter Lynn Goldfarb. Now I must just tell you if Eddie was just a regular guy and he was 102 years old, which he is, that to me would be a fascinating interview all on its own because Eddie has witnessed many things in 102 years. But to add to that, Eddie is an inventor extraordinaire. He has invented well over 800 toys. I still can't get my head around that number. I mean, if you said 50 or 60 well-known toys, that's a lot. But 800, is, I mean, you're a bit of an overachiever, that without a doubt. And <laughs> then, of course, you've got over 300 patents. So I want to find out, I want to climb inside your head and find out how does someone come up with all these inventions? Now, I've invented a young girl, Lily Bourne, who invented a cup because her grandfather had uh, um, Parkinson's and he couldn't hold his cup. He kept shaking it. And she invented a cup that you can't spill your drink. And at 12 years old, I thought that was brilliant. I've interviewed Lonnie Jackson, who invented the Nerf gun and a whole bunch of other things. And, and you might have even come across him in your, in your, uh, in your work. Uh, but of course, you have a distinction between all of them, 800 toys. And when I went through the list of some of these toys, I was like, but everyone knows these toys. You, but when I mention your name, people don't know who you are, but they know your toys. So we're going to find out more about all of this. And I want to start off and go back, well, just under 100 years ago. Where did <laughs> Eddie grow up? Where did you grow up? And, and what was it like when you were eight or nine years old? What can you remember from those days? I was born in Chicago. And, that, and that's, that's where I lived uh, until after the war. I, uh, my mother I, uh, came from Romania. My father came from Poland. Mm -hmm. One day, my father brought home an inventor from work, someone who invented something. I must have been about five years old. And that's when I learned what the word meant. And I decided Right then and there, I was going to be an inventor. But I was going to be an independent inventor. All the companies have research departments, R&D, and they have wonderful inventors working in them. Mm -hmm. But they work there. Uh, I don't, I want to be independent. And, and that's what I've always been all my life. I, I'm blown away because what you said is actually key. You said someone came over to your house who was an inventor. And by virtue of the fact that you were in contact with this person, that is when you discovered that is the thing that you wanted to do. And this is the yeah. thing we try and encourage young kids. You know, we bring astronauts out to South Africa. We involve people in interviews like this. And normally we would have it earlier so that the kids could join in. But obviously it's a little bit later for this one. But I think that if you expose young kids to things, they might just discover where their passion lies. But I Absolutely. think you are underselling something here. Yes, you did fall in love with invention. And yes, it was at a year, at an early age. But you were a pretty good student at school. No. You were. Uh, what were your favorite subjects? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, that, that's when I discovered what the word meant. But I was always, I was already trying to make things and stuff like that. My mother sent shirts out to the laundry. And when the shirts came back, there was a cardboard. Uh, a uh, piece in the shirt to keep it stiff, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, she gave them to me, and I cut them up, and I used to make things out of it. 
So I was already making things. But after my father brought home the inventor, uh, I learned what an invention was. I, invent, I learned what the word meant. I don't know what this uh, gentleman invented or if anything ever happened, uh, but that's when it all started. As far as knowing what an inventor was, that's when it started for me. And then, of course, at school, you were pretty handy with mathematics and science. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Mathematics and science, I was fine. The other subjects, I was just average. But you see, English. what I find fascinating English. is that... I didn't like English, and I'm not so great at it now. But the, uh, English and history and geography and all that. I was just an average student. But you've got I'm 800 toys that. invented. Do you need it? Do you really need the language? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hello, you did okay. So <laughs> what I'm amazed at is obviously mathematics and science are things we have to figure out how things work uh, on paper, but you already had a mathematical and a scientific brain when you were younger because you were curious. You wanted to make things and you were curious. And I think me as a teacher, I feel that if you are curious, that is what's going to make you fall in love with the subject. And if you're really not a big fan of language or history or whatever, because you don't see the relevance of it, I get it. Then you don't put all your passion in. But if you are passionate about something that you're creating because you're curious about how this works and when you drop something, what happens next? I think that that obviously is because you are excited about those sorts of ideas. So, so now you, you you are a fan of mathematics and science. You went into the Navy, is that correct? Well, let, let me go a little bit before that. Mm -hmm. When I was 12 years old, my father died. And that changed our lives completely. He left insurance, but uh, my relatives needed it because it was during the depression. Mm -hmm. My mother lent it to them and they never, they could never afford to give it back. And uh, so we were very bad off financially. So I couldn't go to college normally. I had to work, uh, but I went to night school. But I was actually kicked out of night school because I couldn't pay the $2. <laughs> that, Dude, I mean, can you imagine two dollars? That's what they kicked you out for. But that was at that time, two dollars was a lot of money. I wrote a story where two dollars meant so much to me three times in my life. But and that was one of them that I was I, I couldn't pay for night school and they asked me to leave. The big turning point came when uh, the war started. And I joined the Navy, and I took special examinations, which was all math and science, to get into radar. Radar was very hush-hush and new, and I passed them easily. And uh, so I, the Navy sent me to the University of Houston for electronic engineering. And I spent a year there studying day and night. And uh, it was a wonderful experience for me and an opportunity. Of course, the war was terrible. And uh, and and that's it. That's that's so you, you actually got your studies through the Navy, which is obviously very useful. You learned about radar, and apparently, while on submarines, you were looking at building antenna, you were like the Hedy Labar of submarines where you were coming up with all these radar inventions. Um, and But that wasn't, yes. you weren't making any money out of those sorts of things. No, no, no. But the but my, my skipper uh, left me on Midway uh, Island to work on a special radar and antenna. And, uh, and he picked me up at the, at the next, uh, uh, when he went out next time, I got back on the sub. So I did uh, make this antenna, and I did get an accommodation for it, but I don't know if it was actually ever used. It was meant to pick up low-flying planes, 
the Japanese planes used to fly right above the ocean, right above the surface. So our radar could not pick them up. It was below our radar pattern. So my antenna was designed to go deeper down and pick up the low flying planes. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, so far already, you've had an incredible life. You've been on submarines, you're inventing things, you've gone to university. I mean, things are looking good. And then you go and meet someone. Yes, I I met the lady of my life, of course. And, and not only did you meet her, you proposed <laughs> to her the very same day. No, I met her Saturday night. And I didn't want to appear to be weird. Oh, so, so I waited that. until Sunday <laughs> to ask her to marry me. I admire your willpower and, and I appreciate the fact <laughs> that you, you know, you gave her 24 hours of suspense. And then obviously you I mean, but then nine months later you got married. Very suspicious number, that one. But I'm just saying No, that no, I, no. <laughs> wasn't Lynn, 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 Lynn came to then came two years later. Oh, two, oh, just checking, just checking. So, the, I mean, that's an amazing thing where you meet someone and, and then all of a sudden you know this is the one. But, but what is interesting is that when you started out, financially, you were not well off. And no. you wanted to pursue a career of invention. That's like going to your parents saying, hi, I've decided I'd like to go into acting. Um, it's going to cost so much to go for the classes. <laughs> uh, and I'm also going for creative writing. And your parents are going, you know, it's not really a career you want to go into. <laughs> You're not going to make much money. But you wanted to go in this. And your wife, your new wife, who just proposed to after one day, nine months later, you married, says, you know what, I'll work for a couple of years and you go and explore your invention side. Is that what happened? Um yeah, one of the things I asked her if she had a job. <laughs> Good move. You see, you planned so well. I love that. <laughs> and then, of course, you went into inventing. And and while you were inventing, Lynn, you came along somewhere along the line. I, yes. uh, we, yeah. we, uh, uh, when I asked her to marry me, she didn't say, she was very surprised. She didn't say no. And she didn't say yes. She said that she had a New Year's date with a very nice boy and she couldn't break the date, but I could come over New Year's Day. So I came over New Year's Day and from then on, we went steady uh, for nine months and then we got married and I moved into her room and she was living with her family in a, a second floor apartment. And she supported me, uh, and she said, "We'll see how it goes for a couple of years." And that uh, it's true love. That is true love. Unbelievable. So, so she had faith in in the fact that you could do it. I oh, mean, she, she wouldn't was, have just said, "Oh she, well, we'll give you two years." She she believed that you could do it. She was my partner from then on. Uh, we did everything together. I tested every idea I had on her. And uh, she was, uh, she was, she was really my my working partner, as as well as my backer. I mean, she did financially own you, but that's another story. Uh, and then, of course, <laughs> Lynn, you came along somewhere along the line. Um, what was it like living at a time where there wasn't a lot of money, and your dad was an inventor? I mean, that must have been the coolest thing ever. Right. Well, as I understand it, because I don't remember as much when I was younger, that actually when I was born, he was very successful. That was yeah, a time I, period. Yeah. I was already loaded. She was born in the most expensive hospital in Chicago. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. But there was one child who you couldn't afford. There was a problem at the hospital. The second one. The second one. <laughs> oh, because you moved. You were you were actually in Chicago, but then you moved back to California. Is that correct? No, no, no. Uh, Lynn was born in Chicago. Yeah. And then the second child, uh, didn't you move back to California? 
Uh, well, Los Angeles? Uh, you, you moved to Los Angeles? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, Lynn, was was uh, Fran born in, in L.A.? In Los Angeles. So when when I was two years old, um, oh, yeah, my we, parents we, we, moved to Los Angeles. Yeah, we had a station wagon and, and we drove to uh I always wanted to go live in California because I passed through California and LA and uh, not LA San Francisco during the war mm -hmm. and being being uh born in Chicago and knowing the weather in Chicago I wanted to go back to California I agree with you more I I understand I mean Cape Town here very in fact San Diego is the twin city for Cape Town in terms of weather, very, very yeah. similar. Chicago, those winters, whoo! No, thank you. <laughs> so I, I get you, I understand that. But now there was a little bit of an issue when you moved back to California. And if I recall correctly, um, some of your toys were selling well because you were working with Marvin, is that correct? Yes, yes. And then you decided that you wanted to move to California, which I totally get. But Marvin wasn't so happy with that move. Is that correct? He went crazy. <laughs> so uh, that's just a little <laughs> understatement. And 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 there were financial repercussions because of that. Yeah, he, he he was my agent, and he went nuts, and he would not send me any of the royalties. So now you've got no royalties. You've moved to another state, and and I, obviously financially. That can't be good. And you've got a baby on the way. Yeah, I, I had to start all over again. Which, but I was already known and, and it wasn't too hard. And uh, and uh, it, it worked out very well. Worked uh, which we're very well. happy to hear. <laughs> so, so you get there and now you're starting to invent things as you are progressing uh, what was your first invention? Do you remember what your first invention was in terms of toys? Well, uh, the, the first successful one. Oh, okay, what was your first successful one? Oh, oh well, wait a minute. I'll, I'll tell you what my first one mm -hmm. uh, was. Uh, on, on my submarine during the war, I invented three items, and I, I had a journal. And I recorded them. And as soon as uh, the war was over, I uh, I made the models. And I went to a toy company in Chicago. I was living in Chicago. And I uh, showed her the first one. And she said, I'll take it. And Just I like said, that. That's... Yeah, she loved it. And, uh, and I said, uh, I've got two others, though. And she said, no, I don't want them. I want this one. And uh, I said, but they're a line. I thought it was so easy the first time I showed an item uh, to someone uh, in the toy industry, they they wanted it. Uh, so I said, no, then I, I can't give you any of them. And she said, okay, that's it. And... Uh, if you want three good items, they're still available. I oh, so you sold haven't them. sold them yet. <laughs> <laughs> but now you see, the one thing I've learned, and I've worked with people who've invented games and toys, uh, there are people who come along and say, listen, you bring it to me, I'll take it to the market, but it's going to cost you a percentage. I want my, oh, yeah. my, my chunk that's, of flesh. That's an agent. Absolutely. That... And they're not shy to charge. But then you um, sign uh, those non-disclosure agreements and, and everyone's happy. And then you put your idea out and then a big company copies your idea and says, oh, no, we've also got this no. idea, too. Did that ever happen? No, no, uh, no. no. Companies are very eager for inventors to come with them with their new ideas. The last person they they want to upset is the inventor. Companies copy from each other. 
Oh. They don't copy from inventors. That would be a sign of a very poor businessman. Aha. Uh -huh. So integrity plays an important role in, in this kind of business. Say that again. Integrity is oh, an yeah. important part of yeah, the business. Yeah. I never had an idea stolen from a company. Well, that I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about. But, but, but companies stole my ideas when they stole it to the from the company that I licensed it to. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I then I was responsible to fight for it in court. Yeah, and that's always an unpleasant thing, you know, when when you have something like that, and then you got to go and deal with the court case. Terrible. It's not always pleasant. It's terrible, yeah. But now the big question is, you you invented over 800 toys. I'd like to just discuss a few of them and maybe like how you came up with those ideas because I must just tell you, Chattering Teeth, it's on Toy Story in Disney. It's, it's I mean, it's a universal, I mean, you see them everywhere. And I've spoken to kids today and they said they even have them at home. Where on earth do you come up with Chattering Teeth? Oh, I, I know exactly how I, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a, a tooth garage. Tooth garage. A tooth garage that was a container for false teeth. And I was very young and, and inexperienced and stupid. And I thought false teeth was a, was very funny. Uh-huh. And, and so I said, I'm going to make something with false teeth. And that's and then that's how I came up with talking teeth. You called them talking wind teeth. teeth. Winding teeth. Wind, wind up teeth. And obviously, there's a, there's a lot of physics that goes into it. Because when you wind it up, there's spring mechanisms. Where did you learn how to do all those things? I was very always mucking around and making things and doing things. And I was always very technical. And I was very, I, I, I was a half-ass inventor. I, I was, I was, I mean, model maker. I uh -huh. was able to make my own items. And I made those items myself. And I didn't have any tools at the beginning, but uh, after uh, I, I was married, uh, I needed, uh, finance me, and I was able to buy some uh, machines, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it 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 worked out. But I made the teeth. I I carved the teeth sitting on the kitchen table. Are, are I, those I the original? Yeah, no, they, I, <laughs> these aren't the original, but there they, they are. The, the exact teeth. They the first, are amazing. The first, tool I got was a, a little hand grinder. So then I was able to shape pieces of plastic and I made the teeth. And I didn't know what to do with them. And my wife and I uh, uh, sent out some letters to uh, different places and Marvin Glass answered it and he became my agent. Uh, he said he knows who to show it to, and he did. Irving Fishlove and Company was that kind of a company that made Joker items, uh -huh. and they were they were in Chicago, and uh, wow. And the first and first thing uh, uh, we did is take it to Irving Fishlove, and he bought it on the spot, but he bought it outright. The worst, the worst mistake. <laughs> I ever right. made the worst mistake I ever made, and uh, and I blame Marvin for it. And uh, but now this is actually that, interesting. Thing. And I wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> I'm I'm curious because this is actually an interesting thing. You know, when people create or invent things, they have what they call the IP, which is your content. You own that content, and. If you go and sell it outright, then the idea was invented by you, but it's owned by that company. You get paid out a lump sum, and then it's over. 
And you can only have the pride and the nachas when you watch them show it on TV and it's in movies and go, I was the one that invented that, but I'm not making any money anymore. Did you then learn that, hold on, next time I come up with an idea, I'm not going to sell it outright. I am I going to get the royalties. I'm I never sold anything outright after that. That's what I like to at, at, at the time of the sale, I needed an overcoat. It was winter in Chicago. And uh, so I thought, well, that's okay. You know, <laughs> I didn't read, I didn't know anything about selling inventions. I just knew how to invent stuff. Eddie, I'm going to be honest with you. I think if we look at what they got, they could have bought a lot of overcoats with the number of teeth <laughs> they sold. In fact, they own the overcoat company in every state in the world. <laughs> the company, the USA. But that's okay because Mar you've got a nice coat and that's, we're happy about that. Marvin was starving too. And he, he only passed on $900 to me. <laughs> so I got $900. You can imagine what those teeth have earned. Yeah, but I was able to buy the overcoat. You see, I like your way of looking at it. It was $900, but it's a good <laughs> coat. You see, that's the way to look at things. And I mean, that coat kept you warm while you were inventing other things. So it had a spin off. There were benefits to that. That is amazing. Oh, absolutely. So, I'm curious then, what was it like having an inventor for a father at home, for you and your siblings? Oh, it. Well, I think it really, we grew up in an atmosphere of creativity and ideas and taking chances. You know, it was never like, you have to do this. You have to think about that career. It was like explore, you know, your passions and your ideas. Now, my dad went to work every day. So it wasn't like our house was just full of, toys that were being worked on, mm -hmm. but he'd bring them home and we'd try them out and we'd play with them, but we were never allowed to tell it, to share them with anyone uh -huh. until they were made and out in the market. So do you think yeah. that your course of career was driven by the creativity that you witnessed at home? Of course, yes. Because being a being a documentary filmmaker is a risky business like being an inventor. You learn, you you know, you have to be passionate, you have to be kind of single-minded, you know, in a vision and believe you can do, you know, almost the impossible. And you have, and you have to raise the money. Uh -huh. And you have to raise the money. I had to raise the money. And you have to, as my dad always says, you have to learn to love or accept rejection. So you can't get upset. You just say, okay, I got to move on and do something else or figure it out. So it was a real attitude that both my parents, you know, brought to our household growing up. And then, of course, you ended up making a documentary about this rock star. Can you tell right. us about that? Well, I, I probably waited a little bit late to do it, although I think the documentary is better. Because, you know, I made the documentary when my dad was 96 years old. And, um, but it was really wonderful to do it. You know, one, you know, well, Okay, you can tell he's a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I, I started out actually not making a documentary. I started out doing interviews with him, filmed interviews for kind of the family history. Mm -hmm. And the moment he started talking on camera, we realized it was, we had a film. It's got and <laughs> It's old. It was like, you know, it's like perfect. And so... I think what it did, you know, it, it allowed me to, you know, learn and uh, learn a lot more about my father than I ever knew, and to see him in a different way, you know. And part of it is that 
he went to work every day. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't see him working around the house, you know, on toys and inventions. And, uh, and I was never part of the business. So I wasn't there watching a lot of it. But in the film, you know, we said, because he works in his garage, machine shop in his oh, garage. Oh, I've seen that garage. That is right. an epic <laughs> place of invention, without a doubt. So, yeah. So I got to see him work. You know, he never worked in front of us when we'd come visit him. It would have been rude. Uh -huh. But with the film, we said, you have to just work. Don't pay any attention to us. And we were able to see him working, which was just you know, a wonderful, rewarding experience for me. I love it. I love it. And of course, you know, when we talk about these toys, I know your first one, you remember the first three, and and I'm not going to ask you which is your favorite because that, that you can't answer that sort of thing because you've got 800. Um, I, I do find interesting that you you did pass on to, to Lynn and the kids that, you know, you've got to get used to rejection because, you know, when we go and put a proposal together and ask for sponsorship, you've got to get used to people saying no. And you mustn't take it personally because maybe it's just a timing thing. Maybe it's it's just not what they're looking for at that particular moment. And I'm sure there are many times where you came up with a really good idea, but not everyone's on the same wavelength as you and thought, that's a good idea. They thought, nah, it's not what the latest trend is, but maybe the trend was coming and when you brought out your toy and reintroduced them to it, they were like, this is it. I mean, can you imagine Barbie right now after all the Barbie movies, how <laughs> big that is and all the inventions that go with it and the stylings and the houses and, and all those things. I mean, right now, that's the flavor of the month. But if you'd gone back, let's say two or three years ago, they might have gone, you know, Barbie's a little bit stale. It's not really where we're at at the moment. So, so two, yeah. My two biggest items were turned down by all the big toy companies. What were the two biggest items that were turned down? The uh, the uh, uh, bubble gun. The you bubble gun. That down. That's like one of the most epic thing at any party. You pull the trigger, bubbles coming out. I mean, that's just hello. What Elliot Handler. Elliot Handler of Mattel, who bought a lot of my items on the spot, said, Eddie, why would anyone pay three, four dollars for a bubble gun when they can buy a bottle of bubble fluid for That's 39 very... cents and pull the wand out and blow bubbles? And I went from company to company, and they all said that. But in walked uh, John Osher, right? Led yeah. John Osher and his girlfriend Bonnie. And John started in the toy industry a year before that with one of my items. Uh -huh. And was very successful. So now he came for a second item. And I showed him the bubble gun. And he said, Why would anyone buy that bubble gun when they can buy a bottle of bubble fluid? And his girlfriend, Bonnie, said, John, you're going to make that item. And he said, no, I'm not. And she said, yes, you are. They weren't married yet. <laughs> she was Odie's girlfriend. And uh, so by the end of the meeting, he said, OK, I'll make it. Up. We'll probably barely make the cost of the molds you know, to get into it. But, um, um, I'm sure he's smiling all the way to the bank for that decision. It, and it turned out to be a huge, huge item. And I, I think about four other companies copied the idea of making uh, bubble uh, battery-operated apparatus. They like still kids. sell today. They still pick sellers. And I see them all over the internet and in South Africa. And the kids love it. So, I, I, I mean... Sometimes you, you can't always understand why a person makes a decision and they represent the company and they feel, look, I've seen a lot of things. So my taste is generally what the company wants. Sometimes they can get it wrong. In fact, many times because they don't, they don't think that your idea is what the company needs. 
They miss out on opportunities. Can you imagine how the others are looking at going, which idiot turned down a bubble gun? And all those other companies put up their hand and go, we did. What was a king? But, but now you've- My become... second item, uh -huh. my second, my second item it has a nice story too. Uh -huh. And that was the, the stomper cars, the little cars. I know the, the, the they're like four wheel cars. drive cars. They were battery operated. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, uh, I uh, I showed it. Oh, I showed it to uh, Bernie Loomis, who formerly of Mattel worked uh -huh. at Mattel, a very experienced guy, who said I love it, and he took it. And then his R and D department worked on it for months, and they came up with a six-inch car. And he gave them this tiny little car that was had so much uh, uh, beauty because of its small size. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, he was so disgusted he gave it back to me. And then in and a week later. Bill Garrity of Shopper Toys walked in and uh, he was a banker. The bank put him in the Shopper company to hope to save it from bankruptcy. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, Eddie, I really need a toy. I have no money and I have no uh, shop. I have no designers anymore. I had to lay them all off. I really need help. And Bill and I bonded, you know, on the spot. And I brought out the this little car and I said, Bill, this is really a nice item. We'll do all the engineering for you. And that's what happened. We ended up doing their engineering for many years and they became a big company, all on the stoppers. And the stoppers is a collector's item that thousands and thousands of uh, men, adults, collect. <laughs> I can imagine. In fact, if you go onto Amazon and you look at the rare and collectibles, I mean, some of those must go for, you know, if you kept a box of the originals, you'd be, well, I, I mean, you could make a lot more money out of those. Lynn, do you have a box <laughs> of them somewhere in the garage? <laughs> That's true. That, that, I mean, that they were selling for $800. Uh, from one collector to another, collectors are nuts, you know. They well, one day, if there's a signed them. one, I mean, that would go yeah. for a lot more. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were signed, so now, it worked out fine. I was looking at some of the inventions that you had done, and one that I think is quite remarkable was a vacuum. Uh, kind of like a device oh, where you put an object in, it vacuums, seals over it, and you can make a mold instantly. Now, what came to mind is that many, many years ago, even when I was younger, toys did not have limitations in terms of what we would consider dangerous. So if you bought a chemistry set, it had radioactive chemicals in. You can make your own <laughs> bombs. It was, I mean, that's how they advertised it. You would be like, oh, <laughs> look, uranium, what a cool kit. And then, of course, when they gave you other toys, it could be, for example, put 50,000 volts through your sister. You know, those were the fun <laughs> games. And they didn't have limitations on, on what was considered dangerous. I'm thinking a plastic device that heats up and melts plastic over, there could have been, not in those days, because that was a great idea. Today, they probably wouldn't allow kids to do that sort of thing. Well, I didn't, I didn't invent vacuum forming. Vacuum forming was an a a industry thing. Uh, for example, at the gasoline stations, the big signs uh, that they had, they were all, giant vacuum formed parts, you know, mm -hmm. four or five uh, feet wide. Uh, what I did is I looked at that industrial vacuum former and I made my own to help make models. And then I realized, what if I made a small toy one that you can buy for $14 or something 
and uh, and uh, and and that's what I did. I made a toy vacuum former, a copy of an industrial vacuum former that cost thousands of dollars. And when I brought it to Elliot Handler at Mattel again, and uh, I'm demonstrating it, I burnt his desk. Because the heater that I had inside, uh, the heat went, was a light bulb instead of a heating element. And the heat went down and and burnt his desk, and I felt terrible. He said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And he ran out, and they got Ruth, his wife, Ruth Handler, and they, they loved it, and they bought it on the spot and uh, became a huge item. I, I'm, I mean, that is incredible. But now you have had the amazing and incredible luxury of seeing how machinery and technology has progressed over the past hundred years. And then in the last decade, along comes 3D printing. How did, oh, that, how did that impact your invention process? Well, I started making parts on it. I do it today. I I use my 3D. I have two of them at home in the bedroom. Uh, of course, because I mean, why wouldn't you? Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I have two bedrooms. Uh, okay, <laughs> why wouldn't you? At, 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 at my retirement village, and uh, I I use it every day. Uh, I I make lithophanes especially. Uh, and uh, the 3D printer is a remarkable machine, absolutely tremendous. And uh, were you kicking that, yourself uh, that you didn't invent it? Oh, I, I, I never even got close. <laughs> it, 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 it's a, uh, it's a. But I knew what it was the moment I, I saw the first ones. Yeah, you know, I knew what they were. And uh, I was soon, I was able to, uh, I, I, they're very affordable for, if you have a machine shop, if you have a, a wood shop, uh -huh. they're affordable and they're wonderful. I mean, what's now available on the internet, you can literally go and download uh, CAD files and and print whatever you like, and you can share your your designs with other people. And in fact, you don't have to reinvent the bagel because what happens is a lot of the content is available for you just to access, put it in your printer, and out comes the finished product. And that makes life and, a little bit easier. And 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 you could send the software over oh, oh, uh, with your computer, and someone else can do it. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, so, it really is. So you've seen technology changing, but I mean, at the end of the day, when you're making a toy, I want to know what goes on in your head without the technology. You know, how do you come up with an idea? What is generally your inspiration? Is it like, do you, are you sitting in the lounge? You're seeing a fly going past and you're thinking, you know, I could whack this thing with a fly swatter or... I could invent something that throws shoes at a fly. I mean, like, where do you get your inspiration? Or I can invent a helicopter. <laughs> you see, so you do you do you find that sometimes your invention starts off like completely out of the box, way out of uh, out of target, and then what you do is you start reining it in, or do you try and and create inventions that match a need? You know, I've been doing it for so long, I really can't tell you. I, I'm i very fortunate. I I come up with ideas all the time. And they're not all good, uh, but a lot of them are very good. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, but uh, uh, that's how I was born. I started, my, my, my mother said once, wanted to pay me 25 cents to stop coming up with ideas. I drove her crazy. I love and that. I said, that's not enough money. 
<laughs> I think my mom said the same thing about me keeping quiet, but that didn't work either. So you see, <laughs> we all thrived in our careers. Uh, who determined or who determines if an idea is a good one or not? Say that again. Who determines if an idea is a good idea or not? You said, I come up with some good ideas and some great ideas, but who is the judge of that? Is that you inventing and then you going, in my 102 I'm years of experience? A, I'm, a, I'm a very good, a very good inventor, but I'm just a ordinary marketing man. My son, Martin, turned out to be a very good marketing man. And he's handled all my ideas for years now. And so he takes care of that. He works with companies that I've never worked with in Europe or mm -hmm. places. And uh, uh, not not everything I invented turned out to be a great item, you know. Uh, but they might but still be sitting there one good. day. They become an <laughs> item in, in, in a few years' time. You know, when uh, because I was an inventor, and I never knew if how it's how it's going to pay off if, if it'll be successful or not. So when we wanted to move into a big house, uh, a larger house, and design it, uh. I didn't want to take out a mortgage because I didn't know how the royalties were going to be. Uh -huh. So I, I waited and I was able to build a nice big house without a mortgage uh, because I was cautious. I was scared being an inventor if my royalties would keep coming in. You know? Sure. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I am a little bit less than 102, just, just a few years under 102, and I can't remember where I even put my car keys. Lynn, are you not like completely amazed at how astute your dad is when it comes to remembering all the facts, the names? I mean, I'm blown away at this. I mean, does it not blow your mind that he remembers all these details, everything? is at his fingertips. Yeah, and he does. And um, it's not just for this call. He remembers, you know, a lot. There's certain things he doesn't remember. Or oh, I, I, not I, to remember. I, really, I really forgot a lot of things. And what bothers me the most is that I forgot old friends. I actually... And if they pop up and all of a sudden it'll come back to me, uh -huh. uh, I've forgotten even old trends. So uh, growing old and, and uh, losing your memory or part of it is, is natural. But uh, I can remember what I have to do tomorrow morning, go to sleep and wake up and still remember. But I, there's a lot that I don't remember. Well, you know what? You have a license to not have to remember everything. I think once you surpass uh, the century, uh, that hurdle, uh, then by law, you do not have to remember a thing if you don't want to. And <laughs> you get a free pass if you forget things. So don't worry. You are automatically forgiven. Um, so, you, know, um, you know, I want to mention that one of the things that my father does, has been doing for a number of years, is writing short stories. And he writes 100 word stories. And uh, and a lot of them are stories of growing up, you know, or stories about the Navy and, and the early years. So he remembers not only the detail, but he also remembers, you know, the emotion or this, you know, the, I mean, the stories are, I mean, they're pretty amazing. We just published... He just published his first book at 101 years old. He's such an and overachiever. It, <laughs> just, just cut it out. I mean, can you imagine? Like 800 toys and 300 patents is not enough. He's got to go and publish books as well. Sure. <laughs> right. That is, you know, I think that's amazing that you you are still using the creative side of your mind to do creative writing and to write books and things. But it's also cathartic. I mean, you find that when you write things like that. 
it actually helps you to remember the things that you might have, you know, experienced and, and, and you want to remember. And by putting it down in paper, you always have those memories to read again. If you if you do creative work, and that can be anything that's creative, it stimulates your brain. And that really helps your body. And it really helps your health. I, I'm amazed. Being, being, being creative, if you're knitting socks for your grandchild, that's being creative. Seeing something go from zero to uh, a sock, like on the 3D printer, or layer after layer after layer, that's healthy for you. Yeah. And, uh, and, that, that, and it will help you live longer as well. I think there's something I need to add that you might have left out, and that is a positive outlook. I think that one thing I've noticed is that you always have a positive outlook. So you've got a guy who pays you only $900 for a thing, but you got a coat out of it. So I think that, you know, that does help with the creativity, a positive mind, positive outlook, and being creative. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that keep the, the synapses firing inside your brain. But I want to go back to the, the fact that you've got 300 patents. Uh, why would you need to 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 register a patent, and what do you ever do with those things? The uh, toy company, the company that uh, licensed the item, that's one of their demands that you take out a patent so, to protect it. And and now that they've so if you're licensing it, that means anywhere where they make this toy. According to your patent, you get royalties. Oh, if 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 someone copies, if one company copies an item from another company, uh, if if it was one of my items, uh, naturally they're not going to pay me. Uh, they don't they don't pay me, mm -hmm. uh, and but the company takes them to court and. and becomes a big deal, especially if it's a successful item. That's the reason that the other company copied it, you know, because it was business. a successful That's what it's like nowadays. And unfortunately, yeah. a lack of integrity at, at some point where they realize he's but not going to put it, up a fight. We'll just go and copy their idea. It, it, it really doesn't happen as often as people think. Uh, Oh, it, it, it really has a, it's happened to me several times uh but the companies and the companies were always successful in stopping the other company and and, and even getting uh, damages uh but uh most companies don't do it they, when they see something come out and they know it's going to be huge they may take a chance you know and if remembered to come out with a new item, you have got to tool up for it. If it's plastic, you've got to make plastic molds. If it's metal, you have to make stamping molds. It takes a lot of money and a lot of time to get into a new item. I can imagine. Now, if- uh, Can I just mention one Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. That, that patents don't, I mean, they're not forever. So- oh, not. Uh, Yeah. So, yeah. in, you know, the patent is for a specific amount of time. 17 years, yeah. But you can still have the framed patent and say, I have 300 of them. I mean, if it goes on your resume, I mean, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you don't have to worry about your resume at the moment, but but it's, I mean, <laughs> it's a remarkable thing to have 300 patents uh, and over 800 inventions. Is there one invention, and I'm not saying it's your favorite, is there one invention that you would say is like your proudest legacy that you leave behind? I mean, which which invention would you say? I think if 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 I want you to be remembered, this would be the invention that I want them to tie to my name. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be your favorite I, one. It could just be one that you think would be it, it, a great it, example of Eddie Goldfarb. It's very hard. Um, uh, 
and, and the teeth, my my really almost my first one, uh, was so popular. It was on TV and uh, all the time, and mm -hmm. it, it was very popular. Oh, uh, the merry go sip uh, was a drinking glass. And the thing would go uh, around while you drink through the yeah, straw. Yeah, mm -hmm. while you were drinking your milk. And I got wonderful mail from mothers who uh, uh, thanked me for making the uh, merry go sip. For that is inventing. awesome. Yeah. But, but now you've it got... Really, it really helped mothers, yeah. You've got grandchildren. So do they want to come and see some of the things that you've had, or are they not really interested in your inventions? They were born in that uh, in that atmosphere, you know. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't anything new to them. You uh -huh. know, they they knew about new items coming out uh, since they were babies. Yeah, but I mean, do the grandchildren come along and say, "Can we go work in your workshop?" And you're like, no, 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 there are very dangerous uh, equipment here. I mean, are they excited to 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 learn about some of the things you've done? Or do they just take no. it for granted? It's just grandpa, you know, he did all those things. And, you know. They, they just take it for granted and they do their own thing. My son was fascinated uh, mostly by games. Mm -hmm. He loved designing games. And he had some very successful items. And... Uh, uh, let me, uh, Did you ever collaborate? Oh, 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 yeah, the, the most successful item he had was one of our most successful was the shark attack game. Yeah. The uh, shark so, attack? Was that like hungry hippos where you got to grab yeah, things? A, a big shark uh, eating tiny fish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually eating them. And uh, so he was always involved. And it, uh, he wanted to go in the movie business when, when he was in high school <laughs> at the beginning, but uh, uh, he he went into toys. He wanted to be wow. part of the toy. I must yeah. admit, one of my favorites is the one with the straws, and you put the marbles on top, and you've got to keep pulling out the straws. Oh, Kerflak. I love that one. You know, for me, there's, it's just so simple. You don't need any instructions. You can show the, the children this game. There's a game, it's a game of strategy, it's a game of skill, hand-eye coordination, and just so simple. It was a wonderful item. I had 39 people working for me at, at the uh, top. Uh -huh. And wonderful. And I can't even remember. Was it Del Everett or, or Renee? Renee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I had yeah. I, I I had designers working for me, and it was Renee Soriano who who came up with the beginning of that, who started that item that we worked on. You see, that that to me I appreciate because that is a timeless game. You you could be in any age, at any year, and it's still you could put that at a table with two or three kids. And they would be spending hours playing, like Jenga and those sorts of things. They would spend hours and hours playing. So, you know, the amazing just... thing about Kerplunk is it's still being made. I know, and know. I'm not surprised. Oh, it, yeah. I mean, yeah. how can you not still be making it? It's such a good game. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been can, almost continuous in um, production and manufacturing by a couple of different companies. Uh, uh, anyone can make it. Yeah. But I, I still think it's brilliant. But now, Eddie, is there any advice that you could give young people uh, who would like to become inventors? Is there any advice that you would give them in terms of how to get started? Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe from your experience, what would you suggest to these younger people in terms of becoming inventors? I've, I've been asked that many times. And I really have some good advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it is to do your research. You've got a computer. Uh, having a computer is like having a thousand libraries. Do your research. And regardless of whether the item is good 
are not uh, marketable as, as you would hope, make an impression on the company that you've done your homework. It doesn't have to be a perfect model. It, 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 you can make anything just to show it, but let them understand that you've done a lot of research on it and you and you've made a model and they'll be looking forward to seeing an idea of yours again when you get a new one. So uh, it's not just trying to sell an item, but it's paving the way to keep showing them new ideas as you get them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously you know about the maker movement because you are a maker, you are definitely making things. There's been a, a huge trend in the last few years. Even libraries at schools have got maker spaces where they've got 3D printers. They do things like Tinker Tuesday, where they grab old appliances and pull them apart and the kids are seeing how they work. You know, I think that that kind of culture is creating people who are going to become inventors. But, you know, they say that in the, in the next decade or so, the kinds of skills that you're going to need our creativity, critical thinking, problem solving. You're going to have to learn, unlearn, and relearn. You're going to have to be flexible about things because it's an ever-changing world out there. And I think that, you know, encouraging young kids just to learn how to take things apart and try and put things back together, that's what it's really all about. But I'll tell you what I've learned is that, you know, we've got someone like you, Eddie, who is to me, a, a shining light where you're sitting there at 102 years old, you've accomplished so much, which you speak so nonchalantly about, but, but really, if you think about it, 800 toys is an incredible achievement. Do you ever sit there and worry that maybe, uh, do you have like, I don't know, bits of doubt where you say, I hope they don't forget these toys. I hope that that one day that, you know, they, I mean, because you know what I'm thinking, Lynn, and we should chat about this, that there is an Eddie Goldfarb toy museum and, <laughs> and we are going to put that up in, in Chicago or in LA or wherever. And, and maybe, maybe speak to the, the exploratorium or, or one of the museums on your side and they should actually do an Eddie Goldfarb ex exhibition and they they record you and do those hologram things where you are there to speak to the kids who come in and you get to show them just 20 or 30 out of 800 different inventions. To me, that would be gold. I think that would be something fantastic. I'm just passing on a hint to you, Lynn. So if you want to collaborate, we can always chat about that. But I think that, you know, you know, the legacy that you leave behind, obviously your family are very proud. And, and if you go and do a Google search, you know, there will always be information out there, but you know, the, the value that I think you leave is when a child holds those teeth and they start chattering or the child has a drinking straw and drinks of it, you know, those are the kinds of stories you don't always get to hear, but the number of people that you've impacted is in the millions. And I think that that is something that is so incredible. I actually, I I realized that when I first started, because I wanted to be a physicist, mm -hmm. not a theoretical one, a practical one, and uh, I never could go to. I couldn't even afford night school. I was kicked out of night school because I couldn't afford it. Uh, but when I went into the Navy, it taught me a lot of, it taught me what was important. And I realized that when you make a game or a toy and the whole family plays with it, it brings them together. It means something in, in their life. And that was uh, very important. And, and that's where, I, when I turned the toys full time, I, I thought it would be a help. Well, I can tell you now that if you had invented Monopoly, I would have then labeled you as one of the single uh, greatest sources of divorce in every family. <laughs> because when you put Monopoly on the table and a spouse 
get bankrupt because they land on their spouse's property. Let me tell you now, it is all hell breaking loose. Money is flying in the air, shoes and little <laughs> uh, metal icons are flying all over the place. And and it's so we do not play Monopoly in this family because it's too dangerous. Don't get me started on <laughs> dictionary. But but you know, the kinds of games you're inventing can bring people around. And I think that that's what I love about you as a person. It's, you know, the passion that you bring also comes out in the toys that you've made and and the joy that you've brought to so many people. And for one, I am personally grateful to have Eddie Goldfarbs like you in the world because you do make the world a better place. And, and I wanted other people to know about you it's not fair that Lynn and the rest of the kids get to keep you to themselves and, and maybe a documentary and only a few people get to watch it on that side. I want to expose you to other other people who might not have seen it. And, and I want them, and I'll put the links obviously on YouTube so they can see the documentary as well. I want them to see that it's not just a legacy of inventions, but it's a legacy of joy that you have left. And, and I'm very excited that I have the, had the privilege of getting a small taste of what it's like to climb inside the mind and the heart of Eddie Goldfarb. And of course, having uh, Lynn to, to be there to support me uh, and, and you has been an absolute joy and a privilege. And I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It really has been fantastic. I can go on for another two hours, but I know that we try and keep these things short. <laughs> uh, I just want to end off on something else that is completely off the topic. And that is, um, I hear that Eddie is is not single at the moment. Is this correct? Uh, I, I lost my wife around 10 years ago. Uh -huh. um, we live in a retirement area. And it, it, it's really in our old neighborhood. Uh, we lived in Westlake on a lake for 32 years. We had that privilege mm -hmm. with our boats, and it was really nice. We live in the, we moved to the retirement area. She became ill there, and I lost her. And for the last 10 years, I had a, a partner. We're not married. Uh -huh. I was just uh, committed. Uh, but she lost her memory about two or three years ago. So she lives in a special part to go into memory function. And so I visit with her every day. So it's, it's, uh, so that must be uh, quite hard. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, it's nice. So I'm very fortunate. I, I've had wonderful people around me. And as I told my kids, whoever I would have married, and there were during the war. I met some very very nice ladies. <laughs> whoever would I, whoever I would have married, I would have had my same three children. Well, there we go. You <laughs> see, he's quite a player. This one, I'm well, keeping an eye on him. So uh, it's no miracle. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, Eddie, thank you so much. You know, to give thank up you. your time, I really appreciate it for me. It's it's a privilege. You know, a lot of people, they say, well, why would you want to speak to someone who's 102? What have they got to offer? Let me tell you, I derive the greatest joy hearing from, from your experiences because, you know, if we don't learn from history, then, you know, what a waste. You know, this is our greatest opportunity to learn from someone with a wealth of experience and who's willing to share. How can you not see the value in that? And and yeah, just thank you so much. And and hopefully, when I'm in the U.S. again, I'll, I'm I know that I'm there in the summer. I usually come for a conference, and this year it's going to be in Denver, um, which is pretty close to the West Coast. So you never know. If I do pop in, I'll come pop in, and and I'll I know you don't travel around much. I'll bring the coffee to you, and and just to say hello. And and really, thank you so much. And Lynn, thank you for organizing all of this. And um, Lynn, do you have any message that you want to share? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I you know, I, I think you probably said it all and, and Eddie certainly, you know, said it all, but it's, um, I think one of the greatest rewards of making the film and having so many 
people see it is it really changes people's ideas also about getting older mm -hmm. and you know that it's not anything to fear you know that there's lots of life still in you the ideas and um I'm just happy that you know Eddie and then and the film as well has also brought a lot of joy to people a lot of optimism and enthusiasm and so that, that's been a great experience well that is fantastic so what yeah. I'm going to do is I'm going to end the recording here Thank you for joining us, everyone. Let me end the recording here.